for joining us here on the voice of jabs who's the smart and uh, i am your host as always trying to hack and reimagine the job search and today it's always good to have jack kelly on the live with me how are you jack hey good thank you it's great to see you again yeah of course it's always great to see you and work with you we got some topics we're going to run through today and we usually try to hit what's on the cutting edge of job search and job search discussion. So if you want to dig into the chat, you want to make comments, you want to just hi or list some comments, or you might have some expertise, no telling that you might provide some of the latest information that we don't know. So hopefully that we can help each other in that kind of way. And of course you can go always go to we recruiter dot card we recruiter dot hi-o jack and if you can if you want to just try to contact them always through twitter or through linkedin that's always cool too it's very responsive and you can also get to me the voice of job dot com and also my twitter and linkedin handle let's get with the first thing I read an article by susie welch and most people probably don't know Susie as much as they do Jack Well, who was the CEO of General Electric once upon a time. But she wrote an interesting article. I thought it was pretty interesting. And as a CEO, she's telling you or telling us that we should look for the whole circle of happiness, including professional satisfaction as well as financial satisfaction. And really, we want to discuss really Again, talk about why loyalty is the thing that still is being heard out on the streets of social and everywhere else in the news, as opposed to looking for places where you need to be happy or where you should be happy. Because really, when you're happier, you get better work. Just starting off with you, Jack, and just, uh, I know you've written about it uh, several times in helping people try to find a, a workplace where you may not find it in the first shot Mm -hmm. or two at jobs, but eventually that should be everyone's goal, right? To start with, can I give like a big issue, a big problem, particularly for pale white guys, is that when you go on like these streams and you have a ring light, you get all red and blotchy and it's so freaking annoying. It's like you feel like you're baking in the sun. You're like, you know, at 7-Eleven and the hot dogs are going around. That's how I feel <laughs> when I go on. And you probably watch by the end of this call, I'm going to be all bright red, my nose bright red. See, and you don't get that. I know we don't see color, but I think you're not white. But that doesn't happen, right? Like, it's different. Well, well, it's different to us, although there are times when, depending on the light, if there's too much lighter, I'm actually a shade lighter than I actually am. Yeah, go figure that one. Wait, what do you mean? How does that work? I think it depends on how close light is to you that you could just appear a little bit lighter than you actually are. Yeah, it it does make sense. But even in the days of ring light, uh, it's very scary that the distance and the type of lighting can make all the difference of how you really appear on camera and how you appear on public. Because you get back well, to your question, like, would get back to yes, yes, yes. You know, tell white guy thing. This, we let that go. this is going to sound cold, and this is sound like I don't mean to come across negative or anything, but well, with all due respect to Susan, Suze, Susan Welsh, Susan Welsh, 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 yes, the, like loyalty. I think is there's no loyalty anymore, and ah, oh, loyalty has been if there's any loyalty. In the workplace, I think it's been shattered over the last couple of years. You know, when you just see this onslaught of layoff after layoff, it's it just shows like they don't really care. And then when she was ta- when you mentioned about her in the piece talking about being happy and having, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to her, but she married a guy who's probably I don't know, was probably a billionaire. At one point, I'm not sure if Jack Welch is still alive. So it's very easy to say, hey. I want to be happy and I want to have the right financially, you know, well off and have this. That's for most people, that's just not going to happen. For most people, especially lately, jobs, 
let's take white collar professionals. It's so hard to find a new job. People are worried and they're staying put because they're scared if they leave, they might be the last one in, the first one out. So it's weird. There's a diet, there's a big chasm between someone like her who like has all the money, has all the trappings of wealth. So yeah, you could talk about these, hey, we want to have it all, money, wealth, happiness. But for most people, what I see, and you have people who are listening, if I'm wrong, I'm willing to be called out on it. But I think most people are just mm -hmm. struggling. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think overall, really, it depends. There's two Jack Welch's <laughs> as reading over the years. And from what I remember, there's those who agree and followed his mantra of putting the nose to the grind and never letting go relentless work and all of that and the other portion was a lot different mm -hmm. and depending who you look at that's how he's remembered and to hear that from her i thought was pretty interesting although i think as well that that once upon a time she gave some advice that might be a little bit contrary to even her comments. Mm -hmm. I won't go into it, but mind you, I think that the CEOs of all are not sure what to say. It's better for them almost from an image and from a brand point from the dig all the way in or to dig all the way out. Because if you're in the middle if you're in that lukewarm spot, you're like people rolling their eyes, they're disregarding completely, and it hurts your credibility if you're not in or out of whatever part of leadership, especially when it comes to is that help people financially. Like you think of some of the CEOs that do talk about paying people fairly, they're not popular amongst those who think a lot differently and vice versa. So I think that. A lot of times CEOs don't know what to say, except for, are they speaking to their people in the company when they make public statements or are the people talking to people who are their peers? And I think that might be a question to ask when you see this kind of post from someone like Susie and like others who say they and have opinions about salary and happiness and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I think they're just different. They're different class systems. They're different stratas. If you're the CEO and the executives, think about this. Oh, from 2022 to now with all these layoffs, it's the workers who are getting laid off, but they're not the ones who are making the decisions. So it's a backwards world. So the people who don't make the decisions or the bad decisions, like overhiring during the pandemic and, be and being reckless by overhiring, then when things go bad, they miscalculated. It was their fault for overhiring because they're the executives. Did they take, did they say a mea culpa? Oh, I made a mistake. We overhired and I'm going to take a cut to my salary, a cut to my bonus, or I'm going to fall on my sword and leave the organization. No, they still get paid. They still get their bonuses. They still get their stock. And then they'll let go 5,000 people. And then when they let it go 5,000 people, the stock price goes up. Because yeah. shareholders are applauding that they're being very concerned and cost cutting and efficient and effective. So it's like a bizarre world. So like you talk about, they're in this rarefied world where they're almost immune and where the regular middle class, working class, they're the ones who bear the brunt of their bad decisions. It's a really weird thing. And like, you would think the media would talk about that more often and say, wait a minute. Why are you here as the, still as the CEO or the CFO or other C-suite when like you've made really dumb decisions and right and say, hey, yeah. you're show. And this went because let's say you let go of some of these executives who are making 10 million, 100 million, 200 million. I'm not exaggerating. You these, oh my God, they make so much money. You could easily hire back a whole bunch of folks. Mm -hmm. When you think about the banks started off. Because there are several banks, and I'm not going to name them by name, but there are several banks where the CEO had reported several eight-digit losses several years in a row, and they're still CEO and still get their bonuses. But yet, 
when you talk to them outside of the, what, when it is oldest time, they sound is like a completely different language. And so who you, and that's why I asked, who are you talking to? Are you signaling to your workers that things are going to be better? Are you signaling to your board, which I think a lot of times they are, signaling to your board that this new direction is going to mean something and that you're taking a stand against X, Y, and Z. I, I, I just think that people, job seekers need to learn how to listen with that kind of discernment. And because a lot of times they get mixed up, we tell them to research companies, we tell them target companies, we tell them, oh, at least a lot of us do. We tell them don't blindly apply to any job and take any job and to do your due diligence before you take the job. When you do take the job and try to get solid as soon as you possibly can, we give the hardest advice. In the meantime, the CEO may say one month, hey, we're, we're hiring a lot of people. And then three months later, oh yeah, we got to let you go after all the work that you did to get the job. It is, it, it, it's tough, especially when you're trying to give career advice right now in that mm-hmm. particular sense, because a lot of career advice, half the people are saying, trust the system. And other people say, don't trust the system. I kind of lean more towards the don't trust it, always keep your eyes towards the prize kind of thing. But I think that, yeah, there's a lot of mixed messages and I think it's causing people to doubt because they're hearing a lot of mixed messages and it's tough out there. Yeah, it's, I think what happens, like when you mentioned about the board of directors, the CEOs, it's like an incestuous relationship, you know, that if they take care of their board of directors, the board of directors will take care of their executives. And then no one is really looking there. You don't have someone on the board who's an advocate for the workers. It would be nice if they had that. So you have a seat at the table and that doesn't go on. So it's unfortunate that's, that's what happens. And you're right. Like you have these situations where companies lose money, but they don't then turn around and say, hey, CEO, executives, enough is enough. You keep losing money for us. We got to try something different. It's like a major league football club or NBA team, after a while, if you coach and managers keep losing, they don't stay. They're like, okay, you got to go. We got to find somebody, swap somebody in who can do a better job. I think that uh, job seekers would do themselves a favor is to look at companies that if you're targeting a company that's laying off, is that you need to ask yourself several different questions. One is, am I risking starting and being laid off? in a very short period of time. And that is a risk and that's really real. We're going to talk about college mm-hmm. graduates, but can you imagine what the college graduates have gone through and looking at what's going on out here? And a lot of it might be contrary to what they've been taught as far as their careers and jobs. Because still a lot of colleges mm-hmm. and a lot of professors are going off the old mantra, if you work hard, you'll be okay. Yeah. And that's not a true statement as we now know it in 2024. That's true. It's not what it used to be for recent college grads. It's it, the, the competi- competition is so intense because it used to be when we were younger, not everyone went to college. When I went yeah. to college, I would bet, I don't have the data, but I would major, it's only maybe 20% of the population went to college. Now, Pretty much, I don't know what it is, but it's, it seems like everybody's going to college. And then if everyone's going to college, and then it used to be you would have certain classes that you're taking. Now people go to college and then the major in these like ridiculous majors that there's no way anyone's going to hire them for it. So now they're sitting with a whole lot of college debt and you can't get a job or maybe you have to be working at Starbucks or what have you, and you're left embittered. Hey, I just got ripped off. You told me to work hard. You told me to go to college. You told me to take this what college loans. And now I can't get a good job, but I have to pay back all these loans. And even if I want to declare bankruptcy, I can't. I still have to pay back the loans. So I can't afford to move out of my parents' house. I, gotta, I can't afford to get a car. It's really bad. It's really unfortunate. I think we really, I'm not saying it did, was purposely, but the way things played out, it really did. It's doing damage to our young people. 
Yeah. Let's ride that a little bit yeah. in your article. I think you really, I think it's pretty timely because people get ready to graduate here in the next two or three months. Graduation is imminent and people, it's almost like there's always people who are late to the party. I think the people who really have it right have already, by the time they graduate, have had four or five internships. And maybe some of those internships were during the year because you almost have to show a continuous stream of work. In your article, you say that still their employers want you to have five years of experience for a 22-year-old to have experience of work. When How can that be really possible? The only way they're going to be able to do it is if they're working already. So there's a lot of mixed feelings of that. Did you find, are you finding that, that in the people that you talk to in the conversations that you're having, that people are still overvaluing the college degree to the point to where they are, it's a, another world that you're speaking to? So I think what happens is this, when you say that, do you mean to compare it with the trend also where they're saying, hey, you don't need a college degree. We're going to hire. Is that well, what you refer to? Or yeah, compare comparatively, because there are some jobs, you know, some companies have kind of withdraw the whole college degree thing at this point. There's some that do, and there's some that actually are still ringing that bell. It's hard to give a percentage of it, I'm sure, but is there, may, you might be able to cite a survey that, that says that, but a lot more have withdrawn that old, you got to have a degree uh, thing. Yeah. No matter what position it is. So it's interesting with a lot of times you hear these companies, they always say these things that sound nice. Hey, you know what? You don't need a college degree. We'll take you. But then it doesn't happen. Then they get to ask for the degree. Same thing with then when you follow through for these entry level jobs, if you go on LinkedIn and you'll put in whatever it may be, data analysts, anal analysts, what have you, and entry level, and you'll see they want, like you mentioned, two, three, four, five years of experience. That's ridiculous. I, it's beyond comprehension why they do that. Now, could it be a glitch that whoever is posting these things is just not thinking it through? I don't know. Do they just want to put something out, but they, they're not going to hire? Could it be, I think one of the other reasons that we really don't talk about too much. Going back to the pandemic, I think you had this overhang of people who, let's say 2020, 2021, didn't have any jobs. And then each successive year when people were graduating, so now you're competing not only against your graduating class, you're competing against the overhang of the last couple of, last two or three years of people who were during the COVID world and they didn't find a job or they had a job way beneath what they should be doing, barristers, Uber driver, and Lyft drivers. So like you have this crazy intense competition. So I think the employers feel, hey, we could keep jacking up the criteria for somebody to get the job here. A lot of problems also, some of the postings have been illogical. Even to this day, well, I shouldn't say I don't know even to this day because I had no job like that. It's in years. But there was a time when it, they would have a, prefer you to have a degree even if you work in the mail room. Or even better yet, for those who are in grad school, for them to have a graduate degree mm -hmm. only for them to make thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. And you go, that 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 doesn't make that doesn't make a lot of yeah. sense. And it's scary that people are, that companies are still riding that horse. That's going to be the way that life should be. But really would be oversold college degrees these days. And it's even hard for a parent to convince the children these days, especially when they know what's going on. If they understand the game, it's, for a lot of them, it, they'll go to a trade school first before they'll go to get a college degree. What? Well, look. Depending on the kid, it makes a lot of sense. Hundred percent. Depending on the kid, if let's say the young adult has an aptitude towards carpentry, being an electrician, any of the skilled trades, I would say you are way better off instead of dropping a quarter of a million dollars 
in student loan debt to say, hey, let me invest in myself. I'll become an apprentice for an electrician, learn how to do that. And then if I'm entrepreneurial, maybe I'll have my own truck. And then before you would have a couple of trucks, the same thing with a plumber, the same thing with painters and so on. Just because there's a shortage. If you ever, you probably see this with your own house. Like whenever you need something and you try to get a hold of a contractor, you're chasing them because they have so many other people who want your services. And that's not necessarily the case right now with recent college grads. So you might be better off. And the tra- I think the trouble is that we've become as a society, this very classist kind of society. So that let's say you live in a certain neighborhood. Let's say it doesn't have to be a really uber expensive neighborhood. Let's say it's middle, solid middle class, maybe even upper middle class, even maybe a little under. And if you, and if your kid doesn't want to go or can't go whatever to college and do something else, it's, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is what's going on. Oh, there's a problem. But why? That's a great, given everything that's happening now, it makes sense for parents to start reevaluating. Do, does this young person need to go to college? Does it make sense for this person? Do they have the aptitude to really do something? And is it worth it to literally spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for a piece of paper and maybe not help you? Whereas maybe the other thing, you can, you can make a nice living, do it really well, be part of a union, get a pension. And that gets ignored because for some reason we look down. And let's be frank, this happens a lot. You look down on these working class and blue collar people. But meanwhile, they're doing pretty well. Thank you very much. They're making a lot of money. They're getting a lot of business. But it's just because they're working with their hands. People turn their nose up, which is horrible. Which is like, this is one of the many things that's wrong with our society and how we think of things. We should be appreciative of those people because if they weren't there, our lights won't be on, our, our toilets aren't going to work, our roofs are going to cave in. But yet we, we act, oh, because we're in an office. We're better. And we somehow, I think we have to change the way we view the jobs that people have and not judge them and judge them negatively if one works with their hands and one is just on a computer or a laptop all day long. I think though, if a lot of parents were still, if their mindset and their spiel to the kids wasn't so stuck in the seventies and eighties and maybe even the nineties, because a lot of that just comes from that particular generation, my generation and your generation, I think millennial are bringing up kids a lot different and maybe a little bit more open to adjusting to whatever the market is. Because they're much more in touch with the market because they can see a lot more gold because they're in the computers. They're looking at data, looking at social timelines, they're hearing everything that people are saying about the jobs not turning out to what they're being. People are exiting the corporation world because it's not all cracked up as it used to be. And there are classes of people who are not getting a fair shot the same way that others are getting a shot. So I... There's a lot of things to consider being a new grad, but if you're a new grad, it's going to take a, if you're stuck in it, there's going to need to be some things that you'll have to proactively do. And you may not have heard it from your career service center. And I think that a lot of times, one is you hear from your career service center to get an internship, but they won't help you land the job. They'll give you some of the tools but not truly invested in helping you, whether they're a busy career center or not. That's not speaking to all career centers, but a lot of them have the philosophies. We just give you tools and then we throw you out to the cliff. We know that you're going to land because everybody does. They just don't land in like places where what the degree speaks to. And I think the other thing too is that they have to also create their opportunities more so then the opportunities coming to that. Somebody who's a college graduate who doesn't have three or four or five internships by the time they're graduating, they've got to now spend maybe the next couple of years struggling or to get internships so that by the time they're in their later 20s, they can land the right position. So there's a lot of strategic things that college graduates today will have to do because they're not being told. 
They're just being taught the philosophies. They're told what to do with their resumes, what to do with the cover letters, how to interview, and it can't, and all these things are introduced. There's a lot of things, a lot more things going on out here than just being interviewed and get a job. I don't know how much in your article, I didn't go to, I didn't read it a second time. You're citing the problem. It seems to always have happened. It gets to, they get to February and March and it's, oh my gosh, I just heard that so-and-so from last who graduated last year still doesn't mm -hmm. have a job from two years ago, from three years ago, and they're struggling. It could be scary at this particular time. And then I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of trend on TikTok where you see people who do have a job and particularly see a lot of young women who have a job. Then I think where they interview, they're being interviewed and they're being asked the job and asked how much they Oh, think. this is yeah. something a little different I was alluding to is that where they're basically saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was going to be like this. I have to wake up super early, commute, it, let's say commute into New York City, work till 5, 5.30 commute back home and do it every day after day. And they're like, I'm exhausted. I get home, I'm exhausted. I just have enough time to make some dinner and then I'm done. And then I got to do it again. And, and I don't, maybe I'm naive, but it doesn't look like they're great. They're such great actors that they're hammering it up. I think it's just generally this, oh my gosh, this is what this world is like. This is horrible. I don't have, I can't get enough sleep. I got that little commute back and forth. My job doesn't even pay me that well. I don't have enough money that I can even get my own apartment, but I'm working so hard. And they're like, and you can see, again, I could be naive and this is all like an, an act to put on to get clicks. But it does seem that it's very frustrating. Even if you get a job that they're just... Think about it, but we're used to it, right? But like when you think back, it's yeah. cruel and it's just harsh and you don't have really much time for your, to have a life. No, well, you don't. And thus the calls for more high yeah. grade remote work is so that people can have a life yeah. because, and that's one of the reasons why people are think about it. Getting to adults, you have a family, you have babies, you have children, and you got to come home to also tend to them. Yeah almost as much as you do your job. In fact, you give your job more energy. By the time you, mm -hmm. give your, you get to your kids, a lot of times it's- Because you're exhausted. It's leftover. You're just exhausted. Yeah, because you're exhausted. It's hard. And people are looking for some answers. And some people are creating their own answers. But I think that for most people, they're hoping to get some kind of relief so that we all understand. It's interesting. Uh, you remember we talked during the pandemic with the executives who are, Say, I see why life is hard. But then two years later, oh, we have to have everybody mm here. -hmm. That's this. Right. They forget that they had it hard too. They saw how hard it is because they were mostly men. They were mostly white men who controlled the narrative as far as whether people come into work or not. They saw their wives and they saw the, how much of these were done. But yet they get back to the office, pandemic open. They forgot all of that. Mm -hmm. They forgot all that they said about how hard it is. I can see, I know I need to change. Yeah, you get the you get to do some remote work because of your office and because you say so. But then you're demanding everybody else to come in. It, it's not a fair exchange. Yeah. And people see it. Yeah. So that college grads have got to work, but mostly a lot of them have got to take control over the job search and go and figure some things out way before graduation year. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point, but a college career service is a good place to start for a lot of them, but a lot of them will also need to be a lot more creative and deciding what kind of life they're going to want to have afterwards. Let's talk a little bit about AI real quick. And then I'll let you go. And you wrote an article on about AI and helping people. And I think people are still kind of struggling with what to do with AI. They hear more about how it's going to automate your life more than actually how it should be in a resource like everything else. If you can just riff a little bit on your article 
that you that was just published this afternoon. Yeah. In fact, yeah, so my mind is blown by it. I think it's just it's so transform transformative. Where let's take with respect to the job market, like every step of the way now, AI is infused in it. Everything from screening the resumes to making hire decisions to make fire decisions, how to manage people. Like for instance, it's really interesting. I talked to this guy, Josh Burson. He's one of these like HR gurus. Yeah. And this is what he gave me, as I was talking to it made me think about writing this piece because with the managers, it's really interesting because like he, he made the smart point that what happens a lot of times, the person who gets the promotion is the one who's that, that guy, that woman, that person who's like friends with everybody. Always in a good mood, always hey, let's go out for drinks, let's do this. And then the manager feels like, oh, this person is really good, but they're not using the right metrics. They're just thinking, because this is a really positive, upbeat person, but they're not really looking to see, are you meeting your deadlines? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? What have you? But then when you start using data, like with AI, to say, okay, is this person actually hitting their metrics? And you look and go, huh person who I thought was like the rock star is really just, just all smoke and mirrors. Whereas the other person who's maybe a little bit more quiet and not like a big boasting, boastful kind of person, they're the one who's really doing well. So all of a sudden the data can show, and then it's in a, in a way not arguable because you can just point out, okay, here's all the reasons why that person who was overlooked because they're maybe a little shy and reserved or quiet, but they're killing it. Where the ones who are like, well, the big shot, they're like, yeah, you're really all talk and nothing is happening. So it's, there are ways that each piece of it, you notice, and then you have a whole, like this whole cottage industry has developed where you have these startups, these small scrappy startups, where you could take, if you want a resume, they'll just do the resume for you. Then they could do a cover letter for you. And then they could send out emails for you and so forth. They could actually send out job, fill out applications. So it's every little piece of the way, AI could help out. Now, is it perfect? No, I, it's not perfect at all, but it's still early days. And it does seem like, this is like a huge game changer. Like for myself, it makes my life so much easier. Let's say when I'm writing a piece, it makes it so much easier that I could, what could take hours of doing, like just searching and trying to find stuff. You could find it like, like in a minute, and you could go, oh, that's what it's all about. Oh, now I get it. And it just, it's, it completely makes everything so much better and easier. Well, yeah, I find that I'd rather use AI to help me on the back end than the front end. I think that's where a lot of misconception, a lot of people want AI to do everything for them. And they're hoping that it'll be programmed to do everything for them, or at least the mundane stuff. When in essence, yeah, you can have that, have to do it, but it's not that sophisticated yet. And it may take a long time before it gets to that point because it really can't read emotions or minds or predict what happens. But I will say that if you need to finish things or if you need to double check sources or if you need to make sure that you dug deep enough on, on research, that's very helpful. Well, very powerful as far as writing is concerned. But I know that it's also is helping managers make decisions if it's based on data. I imagine mm -hmm. it is one of the markets that they're using. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good example. So let's say you're you're looking at your data and you find out like, huh, I didn't realize Jack was absent so many days. Oh, I didn't realize that he's coming in late and leaving early. I didn't realize you didn't finish this project on, on time and so forth. So there are ways like you could keep track and see, and not with uh, like an old fashioned list where you're writing it off, but really be able to judge what's going on. I remember early on with LinkedIn and they took this away. I remember really early on when they started, they had this feature and this was great for a recruiter because they could point out and they did, they would share who looks like they're looking for another job? Because even back then they were using AI and because they would say, okay, I don't know exactly what the metrics were, but like it did seem if you were talking to a recruiter, that's something. If you are getting some more people in your network, linking in with them, 
And you would see all these different, are you reaching out to HR people? So then it would be able to formulate and come back to you and say, hey, Jack, as a recruiter, this person looks like they're open to leaving. So you might want to contact them, which is, I think they probably discontinued it because it probably would be very bad press done on the platform that you're using it to siphon it off. So I know they cut it off. Now I could be a little cloudy with some of the specifics of it because this is like 10 years ago, but it's, it could really take it to the next level. I get scared too, where everything you do is being watched over big brother. Well, Seekers should know that what's his limitations are because I think again, the expectation right now is, is unrealistic to have mm -hmm. it do something for you. Now, I think it can help correct things for you. I know the people who put in their resume and have them to do grammar checks for them and um, among other things, but that might be okay, but still it won't, it, it doesn't get down to the court issue for someone. Can you do the job is what recruiters are interested in bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. They're interested in, can you do the job rather than to give a perception that you have potential to, to do a job. There's a big difference, right? Absolutely. Well, um, I think that people, that job seekers are going to need to dig in and try to find out ways that it could work for them. But again, I find it more helpful on the back end of things, confirmations, or if you need to it, it just make, try to find some information that you weren't able to find through Google that you're going to be able to use it to help them perfect whatever they have already or to make it better. But right now, as far as using on a front end for it to do things for you, I think might be disappointed with those kind of results. I know that. Uh, have ahead. you checked out, uh, was it Sora? It's something from OpenAI where you could text to video. It's, it, they haven't given it out to everybody. I think just to certain, I guess, very creative people, but the videos look amazing. It's crazy. I guess it's talk to video and they create these lush videos. Well, I think it, I wonder if it's relates where. I guess the same day where you're able to like, yeah, you're able to do these crazy stuff. The whole thing I was trying not to go there, but I'm gonna have to go there. That's yeah. one of the things that actually happened as far as job scans. They're being, people are being deep fake. There was a company that actually had an employee. He thought he was talking to his coworkers. He was looking at, at video and everything, but these coworkers were scammers. So they asked him to send, I believe it was a list or put it this way. In this particular story, they sent them $25 million. Damn. Yeah. So it, and that was, that's because the, because they thought he was talking to another outlet. I guess they were talking to across this, the country to UK, I believe it is. And they, and of course they were able to use the videos to make a avatar of the person. They were able to ask for this list that that the employee had, and of course it ended up in the company losing $25 mm -hmm. million, dollars. but these things are made to look like the real thing. Uh, it's not made to look fake. So yeah, there's hundreds and hour, hundreds of hours of people that we have now, probably millions of hours, and they can use those things, insert even text to, for that person to say. So wow. make it look like so wild. You know, the actual, but it's definitely wild. But even the software that I use now, I can use it to edit the uh, I can edit the audio using the text. I can even change or correct something I said and it will change it in my voice. Wow. And yeah, so it's gotten wild out here. So people would need to take extra precaution when they, when they are out here on the streets, trying to connect with people and trying to connect with even their coworkers now. 
because scammers have become that savvy with their ways of being able to fool people on different levels and layers. Yeah, people are getting faked out, unfortunately. So, do we have to worry? Do we have to worry or about OnlyFans who all of a sudden have deep fakes so they don't need the real person and then don't have well, deep things for themselves doing whatever they do for men to pay? It's already happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's already happening. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but you should bring up OnlyFans. Like, Good Lord. I believe it. On the side note, I would hate to be single today, being that people are relying on apps and things to meet people. It, it only, it opens you up to get scammed. It really does. And at all levels, it's not just the finance or just not the jobs, but socially, it can be crazy. And I'm sure it is. And I'm sure people, there are millions of stories out there that have happened, but I think on the job scam and that job seekers are going to have to really vet the people they turn to. Look up everybody that contacts you regarding a job, any recruiter, because they're fake recruiters, they're fake HR executives, they're fake career coaches, they're fake people who say they want to be helpful. You just pay me the small fee. They want your money. They mm -hmm. want your, your data definitely mm -hmm. has more equity as far as they're concerned, because they can sell your name over and over again to other scammers who are just come by to scam you. You've got to be careful out there. Well, the job scams are real. They're here to stay. They really are. In any case, what you got coming up you next? I'm just writing a lot. I'm in this, sometimes you're in that groove and you just keep going and going. So I'm in that. And I'm just trying to find really interesting stories to cover. Like, what happens, for instance, I was writing about what happens with all these real estate, big landlords and these big developers, yeah, cool. where if you're not going back to the office, like what's going to happen? And then what's with the full end? Same thing, like with the trillion dollars of debt we have, like, our, what does that mean for like workers and job seekers? Like when we like load it down with so much debt. So yeah, I'm trying to look at real problems, real issues that are out there and just, ju and discuss it. Doesn't mean I have all the answers, but sometimes it's like, what well, we do here, like I'll bring something up and then it, it opens up for other people to think about and come up with ideas and thoughts. So that's what I'm trying to do is write about these things where people may look at it and go, huh, I didn't know that. And then, well, oh, maybe they see some themes and maybe I should tell my kid to go into the trades or maybe I should do it. So it opens up other, it opens up possibilities and different ways to take action. And like you were saying, maybe to help you with your job, to maybe go one way or the other way, depending on how all these things play out. An article recently for Lenza about companies looking a little bit more back as far as banking candidates for coming in. And I was talking with Rona Barrett, who was... Rona Pierce, I'm sorry, she uses three names, but Rona Pierce, yeah. she was with us on Job Seeker Nation, as, but she was saying how companies really need to take the more time. If you want to win the war for talent, you should start thinking yeah. employing your candidates will come again to interview. Ultimately, I think pay is the ultimate thing yeah. is paying for people time, especially when you have them go through five, 10 rounds of interviews. But I think thanking them really does say something a little bit more, making maybe a touch personal and all that. Now, I've got some other articles coming up in cool. the lens. I have about three that are coming up here in the next uh, next few weeks. Looking forward to to seeing what people think and their feedback. Thank you, Jack. What's it's my it pleasure. Like? You know what? We could flip the oh, script cool. so that when you have those articles out, we could talk to you. Maybe we have another guest and we can ask you about, hey, hey what did you mean about this? How is this? this? And you can oh, talk about you know, your pieces. I have some interesting, right, yeah, cool. some interesting things coming up, especially I'm still reading it. The other things I talk about are the job scams, mm -hmm. but I'm concerned that job scams, not just here to stay, but we're going, I don't know, and this is in addition to what you talk about, but I wrote a post about resume looters, how there was a group, this band of bandits uh, robbed a job portal of 
employment data, which included people's resumes and what they put on applications, online applications in particular. There were millions of people, and this happened over in Asia, but just as things happen somewhere else, it's going to come here in the United States. And that's going to be a very yeah. interesting conversation that we're all going to have because a lot of private information other than just where you work is going to come out. So I think that's going to be something we'll be talking about and I'll be talking about for a while because I think that yeah. people really need to be much more conscious about what they put out, not only just on social, but consider what they write as far as on their job applications and consider the platforms that are keeping them the most secure. Makes sense. All right. So I look forward to seeing those other stuff. Well, yeah. This, you've been listening to the Voice of Job Seekers with my friend Jack Hill. Uh, write it for Forbes and also uh, recruiter.io. Or you want to contact him. And your site also helps uh, job seekers, mm -hmm. I believe, as well yep. as connecting career coaches with or career advisors, even with mm -hmm. job seekers so they can get help, right? Perfect. Yes. Okay. We're done here. Peace in the battle of luck. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, man. Thank you. Are you too? Right, take care. Talk. Bye. Bye. Bye.